Uh, hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Dr. Stevens Hospital. Uh, could I ask this week's speakers to introduce themselves from the left, please? Uh, Damien McCallion, HSC National Lead on Vaccinations and Testing and Trace. Uh, Colin Henry, Chief Clinical Officer. Anne O'Connor, Chief Operations Officer. And Paul Reid, CEO. And I'm Mark Brennock, National Director of Communications. Um, Bernie and Lisa are our Irish Sign Language Interpreters. Uh, this briefing is being broadcast live on the RTE News Channel and on the HSE Live Twitter feed. And first, could I ask Paul Reid to give uh, his weekly update? Thanks, Mark, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as everybody will be well aware, there's now uh, plenty of evidence uh, to date, that Omicron variant isn't, a, isn't as impactful as or severe at an individual level as previous uh, variants have been. Uh, however, I always think that this doesn't do total justice to the impact that it is ha having and has had on the overall healthcare uh, settings that we have to work through. Uh, the volume of the cases and the pace of the rise of the case over the last few weeks uh, continues to put a constraint on our healthcare services in terms of getting to the wider demands uh, that are coming at them. Uh, along with this, the impact of having uh, such a significant workforce uh, out with now almost up to 15,000 of our workforce out, it is really like tackling this wave with one arm uh, tied behind our back. Because uh, currently that number is still holding around that figure. Obviously we do expect to see uh, it improve over the next while. Uh, but once again, our healthcare teams uh, have come to the fore uh, and stepped up. And again, I do want to thank them for everything they have been doing. Um, but our hospitals have been constrained in terms of getting to many of the other services that they do want to do. In normal times, this is inevitably one of the busiest periods that we have uh, throughout the year anyway. Uh, and we are dealing with those rapidly growing cases over the last few weeks. Uh, which do put continued demands in terms of isolation uh, across our hospitals in particular and the impacts that that has on capacity. Uh, so and along with that, we are trying to um, contain the outbreaks uh, across the hospital system in particular, uh, because at this time we are dealing with a very highly transmissible virus uh, that does impact uh, on, in a healthcare setting. All that being said, I do want to restate just a few uh, very significant positive indicators of what we are seeing. Uh, and certainly to restate, we are seeing a much um, lower level of hospitalizations in proportion to the daily case numbers that we would have seen in previous waves and with previous variants. Uh, secondly, the window of opportunity that we did have uh, in terms of prior to Christmas to vaccinate the particularly the vulnerable elements of the population uh, has put us in stronger stead uh, throughout this wave uh, and has uh, reduced, and I've no doubt, the numbers of hospitalizations post Christmas. Uh, as we've always mentioned, there's uh, strong and evidence of reduced severity at an individual level in terms of the illness levels. Um, however, I always feel the need to caution this because, as anybody will know, if you're sick at home with COVID, it's not a pleasant experience. But if you are sick, and hospitalized with COVID, you are there because you are in need of high medical attention. And all that being said, the length of stay uh, re re probably is retaining just about the same as it was in previous waves, so still same level of uh, care needed to, to a certain level. Uh, our ICU numbers have remained stable, uh, which is really encouraging for us, and we haven't had to go into surge capacity on our ICU and indeed with our ICU teams. Um, the, number of COVID, um, the number of COVID patients receiving non-invasive ventilation, and we would have given you this information before our previous occasions, is certainly significantly down on previous variants. That is people who need uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation outside of an ICU setting, maybe in a high dependency unit, maybe in a ward. Uh, it's just over 100 right now. So again, significantly down what it would, would have been in previous waves. Uh, not significantly related to the, I guess, acute or hospital settings, but also some encouraging signs in our testing uh, overall. Uh, we are seeing a significant and reasonable decrease in the GP referrals uh, coming through for PCR testing. And that indeed, in, in turn, is 
in giving us increased availability for PCA, PCR testing, uh, particularly at a number of sites around the country. Um, other trends that we are seeing emerging is uh, just to really restate state a few of them uh, and say a few of them quite clearly. Vaccination and getting your booster uh, is the best uh, defence against being hospitalised uh, with Omicron. Uh, today, of the total 1,011 patients in hospital today, 40% uh, of these have had no vaccinations at all. That's at a total hospitalised number. And of the total 92 patients in ICU, at least 48% have not been fully vaccinated. Now, I should say, the figure is probably closer to 50, 51%. Uh, we have an 8% figure which haven't been fully identified in this week. Uh, so it's still hovering around 50% of patients in ICU who have not received their full vaccinations. Uh, the percentage of hospitalised COVID patients admitted, admitted for another primary illness is, is running on last week's total at approximately 30%. Uh, so that is 30% uh, of the total COVID positive patients in hospital today uh, were admitted for another illness and then subsequently identified and tested for COVID. Uh, do you want to qualify all of that? Because from our perspective, uh, and just assessing those 30% uh, this week, the uh, vast majority of those are asymptomatic but infectious. So they still need the same level of attention. They still need isolation on the wards, and we still need to move through the usual contact tracing uh, within the hospital setting. Uh, but that's the broad brush uh, figure for this week in terms of the... Uh, that has changed, I should say, over previous, um, particularly compared to previous variants and Delta. Uh, it was around 90-10, so 90% 90 of the people were admitted for COVID, were being treated, uh, patients were being treated, and about 10% were uh, admitted for other illnesses. So we have seen a significant uh, increase in those uh, piece, people who have been identified as positive. Um, and that's all related to high, how highly transmissible uh, the Omicron variant obviously is. Um, just to reflect, we're always here with you each week and telling you how we're doing each week. I just wanted to flag up a few things that we, we are now, if you look two days ahead, uh, in a fortnight's time, this day, two weeks' time, uh, will be two years since we, since we commissioned the National Crisis Management Team here in uh, the HSE uh, to prepare and deal with the uh, upcoming, obviously, wave and uh, impacts of COVID. And since that time, we've dealt with five significant waves of COVID, and indeed our healthcare teams have had to deal with a uh, potentially catastrophic cyber attack that lasted for a period of about 16 weeks before we fully recovered from it. Uh, so we do have, and I want to recognise again, an extremely exhaust, indeed understandably frustrated workforce having worked through all of this. Uh, but again, a workforce that has done us extremely proud, not just at a health service level, but has done this country extremely proud in their responses. Uh, but in dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges that we have and the wave-to-wave -wave challenges, we, we need to be and are planning strategically ahead about how do we sustain uh, what I would call a pandemic workforce capacity and capability. Um, because, you know, whether it's this and we have further waves to deal with or whether there's other uh, pandemic issues we have to deal with, we have to learn from what's happened in the past two years and we have to sustain that level of capacity, uh, a level of capacity for, for the future. And that will uh, involve what we are currently looking at is the testing and tracing capacity uh, for the future. Uh, we've now done uh, well over 10 million PCR tests um, and a very sophisticated operation end-to-end uh, -end, uh, related to testing and tracing. And uh, we have to look at that for the future. Uh, we have to look at the vaccination programme, uh, which has been recognised in terms of uptake as world-class uh, and now administered well over 10 million vaccines. Um, so we have to look at that from a strategic uh, future perspective. Uh, we need to continuously look at our public health teams and we have continued to uh, increase the resourcing on our public health teams and all of the processes that go around to, to support those. And indeed, continuing to develop our uh, relationships and processes at primary care level, particularly with general practice, who played a really strong role throughout this pandemic, not just in the vaccination programme. Um, so... <coughs> There are some of the issues I just wanted to flag with you that are on our radar, have been on our radar, 
in terms of looking forward uh, and protecting the health system for the future. Uh, just very briefly on hospitalizations, as I mentioned, we've 1,011 in hospital uh, as of this morning. Uh, and um, thankfully, the number of people with COVID in hospital continue, it has increased, but um, not the pace of increase seems to have uh, slowed down, I think, which is positive for us all. Uh, it still is up percent, 12% approximately on the same day last week and about 65% on the same day two weeks ago. In our ICU this morning, we had 92 people in ICU. Uh, which is down 2% on the same day last week. Uh, so again, we have relatively stable, health stable on our ICU. On hospital acquired uh, COVID cases, column usually goes through some of this with you, but just to say uh, we have on the week uh, ending the 2nd of January, we're a week behind in our count, uh, about 136 cases, which has significantly increased. Uh, so while it has increased, it hasn't come anywhere near the peak of what we saw in previous waves of almost 500 people uh, on the 17th of January this day last year. And the vaccination program, just to finish on a, a few pieces on this, obviously yesterday again to state a very significant milestone of 10 million vaccines administered here in Ireland, 2.47 million now boosters and tour doses administered. I uh, just want to reference a few pieces here, uh, which is important that we, for people to still come forward uh, for their booster vaccine. We know, we've seen, and the experience is people are not coming forward to the same level as we were seeing it prior to Christmas. Uh, we were seeing over a four-day period, 400,000 uh, people being administered their vaccines in the four days prior to Christmas. And uh, now we're averaging just below 200,000 per week. Uh, and we do have the capacity to do much more. Um, and it's well proven, uh, the booster vaccina vaccines do protect and have protect, protected further our hospital system. Uh, throughout the Christmas period. Uh, and our doctors, and you'll have heard them regularly, many cl clinicians coming out and talking, uh, being particularly struck about the difference of the severity of illness uh, for people that they are treating who have not received their vaccine or their booster, and indeed the high prominence uh, needing high clinical care, including in ICU. Um, so again, really I will set out just very briefly the channels for people to come forward uh, for the vaccination. Uh, very quickly, just to reference a couple of other points, I've given you the summary figures where we are. And Dame will go into some detail on these across the board, but just want to make a few points. Uh, obviously, in the 5 to 11 uh, year old vaccines, over 100,000 now registered, uh, 42,000 vaccinated, and 83,000 appointments made in total. So, progressing well, and as we predicted, uh, a continuous steady increase in people, uh, parents, and, and uh, guardians registering uh, children. Um, and again, we still remain strong uh, in Ireland uh, overall in terms of uh, rating toured uh, across the EU member states uh, for the years 18 and over to have received the booster. Um, just want to take a brief moment in this slide, which, you, which is just to um, build you from, from the left, I suppose as you look at it, to the right around the what's the remaining numbers within the population uh, to receive a booster. And just to give you a context on it. So, the first stack is obviously uh, the CSO data of the eligible uh, population with, on the years 16 uh, plus. Um, and if you just, what we do as you walk across, I just want to reference a few points on it. First of all, we take away from that the unvaccinated, uh, which is about 174,000, uh, so they, you know, not eligible now for the booster. And then a population who would have just received dose one of 43,000. Uh, so we then end up with the 3.65 population that had been fully vaccinated. Uh, the immunocompromised, which are about 105,000, they have to have a three-month uh, gap uh, following their third uh, uh, vaccine before their booster. Uh, and then we have to take away those um, 112,000 uh, who have less than three months uh, post receiving their second dose. And so they won't be due just yet. Uh, and then for the 360,000, uh, and I'll come back to that figure in a second, not el eligible due to having COVID, which leaves a population of just over 3,000 to be boosted. Uh, and as you see, the numbers, uh, these are slightly just uh, out of date, but uh, earlier this week, 2.37 uh, million uh, boosters is administered overall. There is a further 10,000 now immune compromise who we would count back in, who are now within their three month uh, time frame, having received their third dose. Uh, which gives, you know, a population of approximately 
715,000 still to come forward for their booster. Uh, now, do you just want to qualify that, which it does on the slide there, just to qualify that figure of 715,000? Uh, it doesn't include an assumption that we would make, uh, and you can make certain assumptions of, uh, those who would be non-PCR tested, let's see, antigen tested uh, cases, um, who would have tested positive, and will go through that three month period as well. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a number, 550, 600,000 who still to come forward, uh, but it's just interesting uh, to take the stack down and see those eligible. But a call still remains. Uh, there's still a significant element of the population uh, to come through, and Damien will give you some details of how we're continuing to uh, work through and encourage people to come forward. Um, but just to simply restate again, uh, you can book an appointment online. We're getting a really good uptake. People are experience of it is quite flexible, setting appointments that suit their own. Uh, you can still come through uh, for certain walk-in clinics. Just look at our site, uh, contacting your participating pharmacy. And traditionally, each week, uh, we'd say, don't contact your GP. Uh, or your GPs will contact you. Uh, but in consultation with general practice, uh, ICGP and the IMO, uh, they are now and do have a stock. And Damien will bring you through some of the risks in terms of the stock that's there with GPs now uh, and going out of date. So uh, GPs are encouraging people now to contact uh, where possible. And there are certain GP-led clinics now, particularly at third level, uh, institutions and Damien can list through some further ones than are listed here and we are seeing a very uh, positive experience uh, through those. So I'm going to leave it there for now and pass it to my colleague Anne O'Connor. Hi everyone. I'm going to talk through the service position this week. Um, and just to say, in terms of the graphs, uh, we are in a new year, as I keep having to remind myself, you see a little yellow line there on the left-hand side of these charts. Uh, for the new year, we've introduced a new colour. Um, but obviously, we're just talking about the first week uh, so far. But what we can see in terms of this past week is that we have gone down in terms of our overall attendances by just over 7%. Uh, we're up 19% on last year, so 2021. Uh, and we're down on the same period in 2020. We've obviously taken 2019 off these charts now. so. Uh, we are really talking, we're into the, the next COVID year, if you like. Um, in terms of our admissions then, uh, down 9% on the previous week, up 6% on the same week last year, and down 11.4% on 2020. What we know about this week in January, interesting, last week I was saying we had seen a surge in attendances really, probably a bit earlier than we have in the previous few years. Um, however, we have seen the surge in congestion this week, which would be normal in terms of the first week in January. So certainly our sites have experienced more congestion related to all sorts of factors that I'll come to in terms of impacting on patient flow. In terms of our over 75s, we can see we're down just under 10% on last week in terms of people aged over 75, so just under 3,000 people attending, uh, up 14.6% on the same week last year and down nearly 16% on the same week in 2020. Um, and then in terms of admissions, also down 11.8%. Uh, on last week. And again, these are just week on week trends. So our week on week, uh, numbers, but important to look at the trend overall in terms of the build-up of activity and, again, congestion. And just to remind everybody that when we talk about that older population, we know that they are, apart from being more likely to be admitted, they will stay longer in hospitals. So what we see in our hospital system every year is that we create capacity before Christmas, people go home, we reduce our elective activity, we have beds. Between Christmas and New Year, people start to present, we start to fill up beds, but we're filling up beds often with older people and sicker people who will then stay there for longer. So this week, next week, we'll probably still have people in hospital who came in between Christmas and New Year. Uh, and that's how the hospital system works any year. Uh, but obviously the impact of COVID this year is having a particular impact. In terms of our patient experience time for 24 hours, still 96.1%, uh, down slightly on last week. Uh, and our nine hour patient experience time in terms of over 75s, also down slightly 0.5% on last week. Uh, and down on the same week last year, but up on 2020. Uh, again, this is the most important metric for us in terms of patient experience, because this is the one that tells us how long older people are in the emergency departments before they're either admitted on a bed uh, or discharged from IREDs. <clears throat> Just in terms of our trolley count, we have seen this go up. Uh, now, we have seen significant challenges around our acute hospital system in the past week related to the management of COVID uh, in terms of our capacity, some wards being taken over uh, as COVID wards, uh, and also in terms of our staffing capabilities. So we have had to close beds. Uh, we've been working off between 300 and 400 closed beds this week. 
um, and we don't have as many beds available on a daily basis. So all of that gives to a certain level of congestion uh, because we just can't move people through our system. We're also hampered at the back end of the hospital in terms of discharging, again related to outbreaks in the nursing home sector and difficulty securing uh, carers, for example. So we do have significant challenges in supporting people to go home in some areas. Our trolley counts, so this morning we had 270 people on trolleys, which is significantly higher than the same day last year, but lower than the same day in 2020. So again, that yellow line there in the middle. Uh, and our detox have gone up in the week, uh, again, for the reasons that I mentioned. So up 9.5% on last week. Uh, now, again, it wouldn't be uncommon because we tend to discharge people before Christmas. Uh, so we would normally see a, a bit of a growth this week. Um, and that is something, as I said, that we're watching very closely. So the number has gone over 500. We've managed to maintain it in or around between 470 and 500 uh, for the last considerable length of time now. But certainly we are hearing from all areas now around the challenges of people being able to go home. So home care is a huge challenge for us. And certainly they are experiencing a level of absence, as are the nursing homes. And again, just that's it in terms of, the, I suppose an interesting one here in terms of the day transfers. The challenge for us, you see that darker green line is where people go onto the, li the list in terms of being a delayed transfer of care and the lighter line is where they come off. So where we have more people going on the list than coming off, obviously the number grows. And that's what we've seen for the last couple of weeks. Um, so we're seeing a mismatch in terms of the people being added to the delayed transfer of care list against those who are coming off the list. Just in terms of unscheduled care, we have a number of sites that are experiencing very high levels of presentation. Interestingly, when you look and speak to services, predominantly down the West Coast, so Galway under very significant challenge this morning, uh, 40 people on trolleys. Now, what we would say there is that they have also got significant COVID challenges. Uh, so in terms of their uh, wards, they have 15 medical and surgical wards in Galway. They now have three wards that are COVID wards. They have a further four wards impacted by outbreaks and close contact and staffing issues. Um, so they are experiencing a very significant level of congestion. Uh, and as we've said before, they don't have the same number of egress options uh, in Galway as they have in other parts of the country. So Galway, Mayo, also a hospital that has been under very significant pressure really um, over the last number of weeks, uh, and Sligo. So very high levels of presentations to their EDs. Uh, and Letterkenny had been very high. That has eased slightly in the last couple of days. Uh, but the West Coast and equally the Midwest uh, have been under very significant pressure just in terms of high levels of attendance, impact of staffing challenges, uh, etc. So, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, if you compare any year at this time of year, we're going to see a level of congestion, but definitely not helped by the absence level around our system. Um, as Paul said, that is running really. Uh, we're still saying at about 12% across the board. Some services are noting uh, a bit of an improvement, interestingly, probably more so in the east. We're hearing that sites are holding themselves more stable, uh, whereas in the west and the midwest, they are still in huge difficulty in terms of staffing and the number, and interestingly, the south-southwest too. So it's kind of down around the south uh, coast and, and up the west coast. Um, but we are seeing that that level of absence, the ambulance service equally, uh, again today, up to nearly 12%. Uh, of staff and this is having a huge implication across services the new rule set now will make a difference in terms of close contacts who are asymptomatic um, but certainly our services are continuing really to, to try and manage unscheduled care and COVID and then in terms of elective activity doing very little in many sites uh, so this just shows you the activity from 2020 so a comparison between 2020 and 21 from the end of November through to the end of December so you'll see in terms of the, the profile there is that the activity reduces down anyway. Uh, so we keep activity going up to usually the week before Christmas, when then we have to discharge people and we don't bring in people for elective procedures where they're going to require an admission. Uh, what you can see there, the red line uh, in terms of 2021, that has continued to come down. Um, and you can see very low level there. We're coming right up to the end of the year. And we are continuing to hear now, again, if I talk about the West and the Midwest, uh, they are really seeing a trickle of elective activity. That, that's how it's being described. Uh, so we do urgent, time-dependent work, but even that type of work in that part of the those parts of the country is becoming very challenging. Uh, we are working with private hospitals where we can, um, and we hope to have more progress on that. In the last week, we had just under 1,300 bed days used in private hospitals. Um, but certainly, the elective activity is continuing at a very low level in some of our areas. Um, and that just gives you a, a, an example there. In terms of our hospitalised COVID cases, as Paul said, 1,011 in today. 
Um, and we can just see there in terms, I suppose just to go back there, you can see that that graph has turned down a bit uh, after climbing steadily really since uh, Christmas. Uh, in terms of our admissions, again, slightly lower rate, still higher admissions down to 72 in the previous 20, uh, 24 hours, uh, but still very high. And again, it is the management. So in any day, we have a significant number of people coming through, being admitted. Uh, it was between 100, 130. You can see it's gone down under 100 now. Um, but equally, we have people being discharged and we have people being declassified in the hospital. So a lot of churn within all of those numbers. And as, as I said, if you take somewhere like Galway with three COVID wards and other wards impacted, an awful lot of moving uh, of people around the hospital when it's like that. Uh, just in terms of our outbreaks, uh, we currently have 506 outbreaks open across residential care and hospitals, uh, with two new outbreaks reported in hospitals and 21 in long-term residential care. Just to focus on the community piece, uh, we now know that there's in excess of 2,000 staff who are absent uh, within older person services only, um, and that would include private nursing homes and our own CNUs and community hospitals. Um, we are seeing a significant increase in terms of the number of outbreaks. We now have 160 uh, total outbreak locations. So what that means in our older person service is that 28% of all facilities now have an outbreak, which is a very high number uh, just for older person services. And again, that's across private nursing homes and our CNUs. Uh, we've also had 129 new outbreaks in the last seven days. So again, that's a significant increase. That's an increase of 94 on the previous seven days. So as we've been saying consistently in the last number of weeks, it's the rate of change. Uh, we all hope this will start to change for the better and, and improve, but it is the rate of change that is really proving to be very difficult to manage. Uh, so very significant growth there. And critically, at a time where we do not have staffing capacity to be able to send staff out to support services. Uh, and this is proving to be very challenging for our response teams in the community who are continuing to work as they have done since the beginning of COVID with local nursing homes, with our public health teams, et cetera. And that has been a huge resource um, that has been put in place in terms of supporting the private nursing home sector, as well as all of our own uh, residential care facilities. Um, so in terms of the 129 new outbreaks, that's across all community facilities, um, and we have 68 of those in nursing homes. Uh, so again, you know, significant increase of 57 on the previous seven days. Um, so the outbreak situation, even though we have more outbreaks. Thankfully, the numbers of people who get sick uh, or the numbers of contacts is far less, uh, but it still means that we have a significant challenge in terms of supporting those services. And as I said a minute ago, that is having a direct impact on our ability to discharge people to nursing homes from our acute hospitals or anywhere else. In terms of our National Ambulance Service, their activity is actually within more normal range uh, this week. Uh, they are still very busy and again, uh, relying on other voluntary supports as a result of their level of staff absence. Uh, so they are very challenged, notwithstanding the fact that the call level has come back into a, normal, a more normal range. Uh, and just in terms of some of the other initiatives that we have, we have our GP access to diagnostics. And you'll see there on the left-hand side that for the whole of 2021, uh, we did in excess of 130,000 uh, procedures in terms of diagnostic procedures that for people who are referred directly by their GP, which is a huge amount of activity, uh, with the bulk of those uh, in terms of over 84,000 being for MRIs. Um, and this has been a very significant uh, initiative in terms of supporting GPs and ensuring that people can access those critical diagnostics without needing to be referred onto a hospital waiting list, um, which in reality is where many people stay uh, for some time. So we now have this in place. In the past week, we have done over 4,000. Uh, again, the bulk of those, 2,700. Uh, MRIs and then X-rays, CTs and DEXA scans. So we are continuing this initiative, we'll continue to track it. Uh, and as I said, it has proven to be a very uh, positive initiative that has real impact on people's lives in terms of getting those procedures and those results very quickly. Uh, just again, to remind people in terms of the available pathways, we have our 11 injury units. Uh, and we know that general practice continues to be very busy, but GPs are there. GP out of our services are there. They continue to be busy, slightly less busy this week than the previous week, um, and pharmacies, etc. So we would continue to ask people really to reserve our emergency departments for people for urgent and emergency care. Um, the, the departments are open, uh, but all sites now are really quite busy, and we would encourage people, if it's appropriate, to go to an injury unit uh, for burns, brains, breaks, uh, and other minor injuries. Uh, again, just in terms of the guidance that we're asking people to follow, and as Paul said, getting vaccinated really is hugely important and continues to carry significant benefit for everybody. Um, flu vaccination also. So we have seen a slight increase in flu, 
Uh, thankfully, we haven't experienced anything like we did in 2019, but we do believe that in Europe uh, there are places with higher levels of flu now than they had a couple of weeks ago. So we're watching that one very closely. Um, and I will leave it there and hand over to Colm. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I um, just want to bring you through some of the uh, trends as we're seeing them now and, um, and the impact of, um, <clears throat> of the number of cases or lack of uh, in terms of harm. Um, so we just, uh, as per usual, here's the trend of the case numbers. So we can see the 14 the instance, um, 6,000, extraordinarily high level, 6,181 per 100,000 population, a big, big increase in the beginning of December when we had a different variant, which is Delta as the predominant variant, then the five-day moving average is now, again, at an extraordinarily high level of 20, over 20,000 20, cases per day, an almost 400% increase from the beginning of December. Patients in hospital um, with COVID, um, at just over 1,085% increase from the beginning of December, and those in ICU, much more steady uh, number at 92 and looking at, 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 at in the graphic of uh, new cases of COVID is in the month of January for weekly average up to those 22,000 cases. And likewise, hospital in blue and ICU, you can see a much steadier, uh, consistent level leveling off of patients' intensive care units. But uh, look, focusing on the cases, uh, about a quarter of all cases in the past 12 months have happened um, since the 1st of January. And one in 16 people in the country have had a positive PCR in the past 14 days, which, which uh, speak for themselves. And looking at the demographics, um, we've seen this push to the left in recent weeks, uh, possibly as a, or probably as a consequence of the booster program, where the predominant number of cases were rise, where the, the greatest rise we saw were, were in the 19 to 45-year-old uh, age group. But we still see rises in all age groups, some substantial rises on the right-hand side, but they're going from very low numbers, very low basis. Outbreaks have been alluded to. Another sign of heat in the healthcare system and 56 outbreaks in nursing homes, seven the previous week, acute hospitals 22, eight the previous week. And then when we look at the, at the kind of disruption associated with those on the left-hand side, um, we see the number of hospital acquired cases. And there's a very particular definition for this, that somebody who tests positive after seven days of admission to hospital. We see 136 in a week ending January the 2nd. On the right-hand side, the big impact on cases. Again, that graph tells the story that we were he hearing of the disruption to healthcare in the form of staff absences related to COVID. And we see an extraordinary jump in the number of new confirmed cases in hospital staff of now over 2,000 cases from what was a very low base and, is, and um, only a matter of weeks ago, and is well in excess of the peak we reached of almost 1,000 in January of 2021. We've mentioned this already, those requiring respiratory support outside of intensive care, and this is a sign of heat again in the system. When our intensive care units are under pressure, we see more patients receiving high-end care, respiratory care, high-flow oxygen, positive pressure ventilation outside intensive care. So we can see that the total number is that red at the top and broken down into those who are receiving care due to COVID is 97, and those for other respiratory conditions at 121. So it's not nearly as hot as it was um, in, in January of 21 again, when we saw big, big numbers of patients receiving care uh, outside, almost 500 receiving care out of intensive care, and some of which it certainly would have required admission to intensive care, but care had to be provided outside. But in, uh, this time we're still seeing high numbers, but again, steady. So what's the update from the ECDC current uh, uh, limited preliminary evidence suggests that Omicron has a less severe clinical presentation, but the evidence supporting this is gathering pace. The overall level of risk to public health is still rated as very high, and this is because of the huge case numbers, and even if they translate in lower in a lower uh, ratio to hospitalisation ICU, it still represents a considerable threat to healthcare systems across Europe. So looking at experience across the world, this is New York. The blue line there shows the numbers of cases increasing at an extraordinarily fast rate. Uh, the yellow line uh, shows hospitalizations have just, there surpassed Delta peaks while ICU admissions and deaths also rising rapidly. So there's been some decoupling, which is the word, the link has been weakened between the cases 
and hospitalizations, but in that particular region, um, not, not as strong as we've seen in some European countries. And that may be due as attributed to the elongated delta wave in the, uh, in, in the US. In London, we see the case numbers well in blue line again, well surpassing the delta peak uh, on the 2nd of November almost 3,000 new cases in contrast to 90,000 on the 8th of January. The number of daily patients admitted to hospital increased as, as the yellow line as case numbers rose, but it started to decline in recent days. And the number of deaths in ICU, that, that's the most extreme version of harm, of course, have remained stable over recent months, despite the rise in case numbers. Again, showing this, this term, we're all going to use this decoupling between cases and the more severe expression of disease. So what about Ireland? Uh, our, our case numbers are well surpassed the Delta peak. Um, the number of daily patients admitted to hospital has increased. That's the yellow line. And so if you think of the yellow line in the other two graphs, the number of deaths in ICU, the most extreme version of harm, have remained stable in recent months, despite the rise in case numbers. And just giving us some idea, we've been asked repeatedly here over the almost two years now, if what, what, how do the cases translate into harm? And back in January of 21, uh, it, it's difficult to know in, in the first surge back in 2020, because of course the testing capacity was a fraction of what it is now. But back in January 2021, 20, when we were probably identifying the great majority of cases through testing, of every thousand cases identified, there were about 50 hospitalizations and that fell to 25 as everybody got vaccinated of course that january uh, the vaccination program only started then and then uh, what, what are we seeing now we were seeing now probably five to ten hospital admissions for a thousand cases so it's a much a big drop in our experience here and we're not comparing like to like with all these surges because uh, uh, it depends on whether or not we're able to identify all the people who've, who've got COVID or not and, and that's unlikely at the moment because of the huge volume of cases but there does seem to be a lowered conversion of cases through to hospitalization. And there is studies from South Africa strongly supports this, for, is, this, this particular district in South Africa, the global epicenter of the Omicron outbreak. And this compared people admitted with COVID since the commencement of Omicron against uh, almost 4,000 admissions from the three previous waves. What did they find? They found that even correcting for vaccinations and previous infection, there was a, a reduced um, risk or severity of Omicron of the order of 25%. So the, the, in other words, Reduced virulence is a term we use, but reduced severity is, is how we would all understand this. So this virus, even when you allow for all the protection effects of vaccination and the immunity acquired from natural infection, there's a reduced harm or severity of the order of 25% from the Delta variant. Um, the US study, again, uh, th th again, this experience has been replicated. Less hospitalizations, yet less admissions to ICU, and less admissions, um, uh, less length of stay. But again, all compared to Delta. And let's not forget how fierce Delta was in terms of its, uh, its, its transmissibility and in terms of uh, much illness it caused. So we're, we're comparing against a variant that in itself caused a lot of illness, caused considerable pressure in the healthcare system, and caused a lot of death. Um, this graph shows this protective effect of vaccine, the booster, uh, the, 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 protect, the boosters do seem to wane as we've been reported over a number of weeks, but there's strong evidence that protection against severe illness is maintained, not just by the boosters, but, but, but by particularly by the primary vaccination course we know about. The EMA update on this, risk of hospitalization after infection Omicron estimated to be, to be about a third and a half of the risk of the Delta variant. Vaccination continues to provide a high level of protection against severe disease and hospitalization linked to Omicron. People who have had a booster dose are better protected than those who've only received the primary vaccination course. And vaccination remains an essential part of the approach to fighting the ongoing pandemic. And to visualize that different um, flood walls, if you can see four parts of the flood wall of defense, the two vaccines is the first part, gives some protection, but the, the virus par viral particles can, can breach it easily enough the booster vaccines are more solid, longer and thicker flood wall. These memory B cells, which are left behind after the primary vaccination course, and these T cells, part of our immune system memory, linger on and give us solid protection, even if we received only the primary vaccination course. But they themselves are reactivated with a booster course. So it's best to think of the defense system as not just one single entity, but different components forming an integral protective protection against infection, against severe illness. The boosters, uh, Damien will speak to this, uh, we're seeing good uptake, particularly in those vulnerable groups. Um, well, I think is approaching almost 60% of the eligible population now will have received the booster, all of which is good. And, and look at the uptake in medically vulnerable healthcare workers. These are the, 
the groups that we really want to protect in order to protect services, in order to protect, uh, in, in, to reduce severe illness. So key messages today, finally, um, Omicron highly transmissible, a lot of immune evasion um, from vaccination and from prior infection. Healthcare services under huge pressure due to the sheer volume of cases. Unvaccinated people, we talk about the reduced severity, but let's not forget we're comparing that to the Delta. And it's important to emphasize that people who are not vaccinated don't have any protection, not just from acquiring, uh, from catching the virus, but also from severe illness. Uh, vaccinations alone will not control case numbers regarding the very public health measures, such as reducing contacts, mask wearing remain critical to control case numbers, as is reflected in the most recent advice, which is to start, I think, at midnight tonight. And vaccines remain critically important to protect against severe disease and prevention of infection with COVID much, much easier than treatment in an intensive care bed. Thank you. And I'll pass over to my colleague, Darren McCallion. Thanks, Colin. So I'll just talk about our testing system first and tracing systems. So just the slide you're familiar with in terms of our capacity. Uh, PCR capacity now is pretty close to maxed out with some small additional changes at 300,000 tests per week. The antigen capacity has grown substantially up to 600,000 per week in recent weeks. Uh, so, you know, I suppose in total nearly 900,000 capacity across the testing system now in place, I suppose, to support the, the response. Just on testing trends there, so I just want to highlight a couple of things. Paul referred earlier to the GP referrals. Uh, so we saw a huge spike in that in the week coming into Christmas, just maybe coming up there, just slightly different on, on the screen, but a big increase in that two, two weeks ago. And we've seen a drop off in that in the last week in terms of GP referrals. So these are people who are typically symptomatic who go to their GP with concerns. Uh, and as I say, a big increase, and then seeing that slightly tailing off. Community referrals, so these are largely self-referrals. Again, big peak in a similar week uh, and a slight tailing off this week. And again, anecdotally today and over recent days, we're seeing some improvement now in access to test centres in relation to appointments across the system. Still plenty of challenges, still plenty of people looking for appointments uh, and lots of challenges in some parts of the country, but much more accessible than would have been the case heretofore. And you may recall that we prioritise clinical referrals so those GP and close contact referrals uh, were obviously in that surge week there, monopolising a lot of the appointments. And in addition, our laboratories now undertaking over 300,000 tests last week. Just on the antigen side, again, to give you a sense of progress, last week was the busiest week, a big spike. And you know the public health rules in relation to antigen testing has been changing over recent weeks and a lot more emphasis on it in terms of perhaps the symptomatic cases under 40, the asymptomatic close contacts, our school pods early years, some of our screening programs in the food industry and so on. So again, a big increase in terms of the number of test kits that have been booked out for people, over 350,000 across the different testing programs last week. Just then in terms of the changes to, to come in tomorrow, I'm not going to go through them in detail, just I suppose a couple of points to make. One is that it will allow positive antigen tests to, to be recorded uh, through a new portal and people will not need to have a confirmatory PCR test and that's based on, on the advice from um, Neffet and, and our medical people around that. Separately then, people will be able to report those tests and load their close contacts for the purpose of contact tracing and informing those people. And lastly then, those will receive an SMS directing them to HSC website where they'll get further information in terms of the actions they need to take, both in terms of any restrictions of movements, which also change, but also in relation to testing where it's appropriate. And just, I suppose, to give you an ex a sense, really, of the extent of the work that's needed in the background to achieve this, I'm not going to go through all of this, but public health, again, have to work through all the advice, the online IT system, a new system developed to support that, the existing PCR test system changing, the texting system has to change, all of the contact tracing, Scripts and scenarios have to be updated. Over 800 staff have to be trained between today and tomorrow. Uh, reworking of all of the guidance on hsc.ie through our communications and digital team, all the public communications that need to go out, redevelopment of the antigen testing process, and again, putting in place additional supply and distribution channels for antigen testing. So a very significant amount of work required in order to implement any time we have these changes. So just to, to reflect that. Just some headlines there, I've covered most of the numbers. Uh, the only thing I'm going to maybe flag that we haven't covered is probably we continue to make a very significant number of calls through our contact tracing service and also the positivity rate 
continues to, to rise, and you'll see that in terms of week on week. So finally, on our testing and tracing system, the key message is capacity has grown up to a very substantial number across our PCR and antigen side. Again, seeing a slight decrease in community um, referrals, but positivity staying high, and GP referrals, again, an inc decrease, but from very high numbers over the last number of weeks. A huge number of tests undertaken and completed, 650,000 over the last week. Uh, and again, look, still seeing challenges in terms of accessing the PCR system, but some chinks of light around that over the last couple of days. Again, we continue to offer our pop-up service. So where we see demand around the country, we have the pop-up service that comes around mobile testing units. And there are some of the, the locations around the country where they've been based over the last week and continue to be through this week as well. And again, as I said, reflecting some of the public health guidance changes, a lot more work going into the distribution of antigen tests over the last couple of weeks. And finally, just the new public health advice will go into play from tomorrow. So moving to our vaccination programme, just some of the headlines. Again, to recap, we're continuing to see some people come through on the primary dose, and, and that's really good. Uh, 8,000 in the last seven days for either dose one or completing their dose two. And again, if you look at Column's information about the impact of those that are unvaccinated in hospital, again, that's a really important message that we want to continue to get across to people. And all of the channels are available to support people in that. Paul referred to the 10 million vaccines. Again, we're still doing well in European terms as well. Uh, and at the moment, we estimate there's about 715,000 people still eligible. Uh, although, again, we've only really started with those younger age groups in recent weeks coming into Christmas when we opened all ages to all channels. So I suppose our core message today on the vaccine is we're encouraging people to come forward for their booster. It's really important in terms of protecting yourself and your family. There are other benefits as well, but that's the core message we want to get across. We have good supply out across all of our channels, over 1,300 GP practices, 700 pharmacies, 35 vaccination centres. And again, because we distribute the vaccine to those centres, we really do need to get people to come forward because the risk on our side then is the vaccine has a very short shelf life of 30 days, this particular vaccine, and we want to minimise any risk of expiration as we move through this phase. So again, Paul and Colm have talked about the update, just maybe one or two additional points I'd make, which has been very favourable. In relation to recent research, it is indicating that people do want to get the vaccine, but perhaps they simply have yet to do so. So that's why, again, we're really reinforcing this appeal today for people to come forward. We've set up a series of initiatives to try and support that around targeted communications using SMS. Our GPs, again, as part of the process of using vaccine, have been working with third level colleges a number underway this week, five more next week. And again, that's trying to appeal to those younger age groups who've only recently opened up and people going back to college over the next couple of weeks. So just in terms of those ages, that just reflects the numbers. I'm not going to go through them all in detail, but just to say, for, particularly for those younger ages that have opened in recent weeks, we'd encourage them to come forward for public health reasons in terms of their own protection. And we know that 700,000, that does exclude people perhaps who've had COVID in recent weeks. We know they have to wait for three months. So there's still substantial numbers there. We've been able to factor that into our planning. Uh, so we know, and I'll come on to that in a moment, that will have an effect for some people on the current guidance where they need to wait for three months to get their booster vaccine. And this graph here is really, I'm not going to go through the detail, but what it's reflecting is that there's around half a million people who were either immunocompromised, who were only going to become eligible for their dose uh, over these weeks. This is between now and April, the next three months. Uh, and also those, the high numbers that we've seen in recent, the last month, I guess, due to infection, but become eligible over the next three months. So in other words, we will have a little bit more complication to deal with and the people can only come forward as they hit that three month window. And for those who are immunocompromised now starting to become available for vaccine or eligible to receive their booster vaccine, they can now come forward for any of our walk-ins or scheduled appointments they'll be seen or through GPs. And again, we'll be working to also get appointments out to them over the coming weeks as well. And we're very conscious they're a very important group who are prone to, to infection. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Damien. And now we'll open up to questions. If you could just identify, give us your name and media organisation, please. Yes, thank you. 
Hi, how's it going? Um, Sean Murray from the Irish Examiner. Um, uh, Damien, you were saying at the end there that uh, it's important that people come forward for, for their booster vaccine because the, the supply has been issued to centres and things like that. Um, uh, do you have any data on how many vaccines might be at risk of going off, as it were, as in not being able to use them? Do you have any data on that? Yeah, well, I suppose the rationale for people to come forward is more in terms of their own protection um, you know, and, and for their family and, and friends and so on, rather than you know, the fact that we have the vaccine there. Uh, we're not really at risk at the moment, but that risk is going to emerge over the coming weeks. So we will have a supply out across the 1,300 GPs, you know, the 700 pharmacies and the, vac the vaccine centres. So I wouldn't put a number on it today because it's only as we see what the take-up is this week and into next week that we'll be able to assess what that looks like. If that take-up improves, that risk drops back. Uh, so we monitor that on a weekly basis, but essentially it is really driven by the numbers game, in other words, the numbers that come through versus what's out there in terms of stock that people have. You'll see general practitioners at the moment proactively going out now in their own communities on local radio, across social media, you know, setting up special clinics and pharmacies similarly, doing a lot of work to try and encourage people to come forward. But as I say, the primary motivation is for people themselves, but obviously from a programme perspective, we also want to try and get people to take that opportunity now when the vaccine is there. And just to recap another important point, those under 30, receive Pfizer, those over 30 can receive either vaccine. So again, you know, we have to manage that across all of the channels as well. Um, yeah, pro probably another one for yourself. Um, in terms of the, the kids who are aged 5 to 11, how many of the those in the high risk category have been vaccinated now or have all of them been issued with, with dates for their vaccine as of now? Yeah, so the vast majority of those now have had appointments. And in terms of the actual number going through, I think we had about 12,000 were um, that had appointments scheduled, all of those from the first week. You might remember the model we had, we couldn't identify them uniquely, and they had their week where they were able to register first. So all of those have had appointments and they're being channeled through the system. Some people may have switched their appointments. I wouldn't have an exact number in terms of those gone through, but the vast majority are starting to go through now. Colin, if you would more. Just for looking at that group, um, there's only one, this is the group for the, which the vaccine is highly, strongly recommended for the NIAC guidelines. There's three subgroups and only one of them pertain directly to the child themselves and their underlying conditions. The other two are, are determined by who the child lives with, whether it's a vulnerable adult or another vulnerable child. So that's why we have a self-registration system in place that it's, it, it, it's up to, um, to parents, having, having, us having provided them with the information they need to register their child if they want the vaccine for their child, having read the information, and if their child falls into one of these three subgroups. So it's not as if there's a, a we've talked many times about disease registries, this goes beyond this because it's a, it's a vaccination, that element of the childhood vaccination programme covers not just children who are vulnerable themselves, but those who are living with other vulnerable people. I was just to, re, to reinforce, sorry Paul. No, go on, Damien, go on. I was only going to say, just to reinforce the point that there is good progress made. We know those appointments were scheduled over a short period of time, but people may, well, for understandable reasons, based on their own care and so on, have rescheduled. But of the 100,000 that have registered, there's 83,000 already have appointments and 42,000 have received their first dose. So in general terms, there's huge numbers already going through in terms of, of those that have been registered. I was just going to make the point, in, when we look at that window of the first week, it was a self-declaration. So we assume everybody in that week was in those categories, and of that, there was just about 12,000, uh, and the vast majority of those are done or have an appointment. Um, and uh, just in terms of, you, you were saying that like all the people who have had COVID over the Christmas time say they have to wait three months before they get the booster. Is, is both the availability there in terms of supply and the capacity, like we're talking maybe March, April, where there'd be like a large cohort of people because we'd like to so many tens of thousands of people who've had it. Is there is, is all that there to kind of ramp up when, when that when that window opens for them? Yeah, in that context, I suppose supply isn't an issue. The complication for us, obviously, is you've got to maintain the programme for a much longer period uh, with small numbers. And again, we've got to make sure we try and give people good access. I suppose one of the strengths of the primary vaccination programme and indeed of the booster programme is Geographically, you have 1,300 GP practices, the vast majority in the country have participated, 700 pharmacies, and you have the 35 centres. So clearly, when you're down to very small numbers and you're trying to manage supply, we'll have to do that. But yes, supply isn't an issue in relation to that profile over the next three months. That's great. Um, just in terms of the, the pressure on hospitals at the minute, like we're, we're saying that the we're obviously not seeing hospitalizations anywhere near like we were seeing last January, say. But in turn, like we're, we've had high case numbers consistently for weeks now. Even if the hospitalizations in ICU were to remain at the level that they are now, could you maybe speak to how much of pressure that will put on on the health service in the coming weeks in, in, in terms of that, even if it doesn't go significantly down, if it stays where it is? Yeah, I think the thing is, it's, it's, what we've got to remember is that 
our, our tap, if you like, so the more COVID cases we have, the less we can do of other things. The thing we can't control are the numbers of people who are presenting with COVID or the number of people presenting to our emergency departments for unscheduled care. The only control we have is to not book elective care, you know, in simple terms. Um, and we don't want to do that. You've seen from the chart there, our elective care came right down to December. And as I said, we have parts of the country now who are literally describing it as a trickle of elective care going through. Uh, and that's not in anybody's interest. We have people who are out there waiting a long time for procedures, who've maybe had them cancelled. We've done a lot of work on our waiting list. I showed that last week. Um, but the reality is, in terms of people who are listening to this, who are awaiting hospital appointments, all of those are being impacted by this. Uh, so the pressure on hospitals uh, is that they can't do that type of work. So we're very busy. We're trying to manage COVID and non-COVID environments. Like I said, in Galway, seven of 15 wards today impacted. Uh, that has massive uh, implications in terms of how we run hospitals, how we staff hospitals, but critically, the really important work that we just can't get to. Um, and that's the real impact. Just add, the, the other challenge for us is we're all focused on wh when is the peak and what happens. And, but it's not over for us in the peak. This will be a very slow and continuous trend downwards, we expect, afterwards. So we will be dealing with this for many weeks after we reach the peak. And that's been the experience on previous variants as well. So. There'll be continuous strain on the, and as Anne said, and I said myself earlier on, it's, it is constraining us from other services. We want to get back to other services. Hopefully, as we start to see significant numbers of staff coming back, which we expect, it'll start to relieve some pressure on the system. Casey Reardon from News Talk. And just two questions for me. Um, so the Health Minister earlier on admitted that the antigen test portal that's opening tomorrow, you know, is open to misuse. Was there ever a discussion around putting safeguards in to ensure the information being inputted by the public is correct? Because I suppose it's possible that some people falsely claim to have tested positive via an antigen test in order to obtain a recovery cert, for example. So you could then have a scenario where people who aren't vaccinated are, you know, dining indoors, for example. So maybe why weren't those safeguards put in place? I'll just give a general point, and Damien might want to add to it. Look, everything we've done about all the waves of COVID so far has been with public goodwill, uh, communications around the rationale for all the actions that we take, and winning people's hearts and minds, as I've said before. Uh, a lot of what we do is about self-declaration, uh, and that inclu included just what we're talking about, the 5 to 11-year-old high-risk kids in that period in that week. So, uh, And equally in terms of the to, to be able to build in all of the constraints uh, and then not have the issue of self-declaration. Uh, it's just a burden that, you know, hasn't been needed throughout COVID. I think that, that's been reflected. We haven't seen any major misuse of it to date. Uh, I'm not fully sure what the Minister said today, but we, we haven't seen any major misuse of it to date. And self-declaration has been a lot of what we've done, been doing throughout COVID. Damien, do you want to add any? Just yeah, I just, I suppose, building on what Paul said, I think anyone who self, in any self-testing system, you're reliant on the person to give the information. It's important to remember the purpose of it. The purpose of it is so that you can actually give the person the public health advice, identify the close contacts, give them public health advice and get them tested if necessary. So it isn't for the, any other purpose in, in effect. Uh, we did look at other measures you could put in place, but it would be very restrictive then in terms of from a, this is primarily for public health purposes and hence that's the rationale. And there are very limited uh, measures or safeguards that you could put in place in any case in that sort of self-testing scenario. And again, to bear in mind, for the purpose of a recovery certificate, it's PCR or a professionally administered antigen test. The regulations are very clear. So it doesn't assist people in that regard in, in, in any case. So only PCR to get the, the, the recovery cert grant? Or, or, or sorry, just, or, or professionally administered, in other words, through a pharmacy or through a, a regulated professional in terms of an antigen test kind of clears up that. And then secondly, just I, I think this might have been touched on last week, but I'm just wondering if someone can explain why do you have to wait if you've um, if you've tested COVID positive? Why is there that wait period of three months? Like what's the medical reasoning for having to wait until you get your booster? And why is it three months here and then only a month in the UK? Like, are we being overly cautious about it? Yeah, I take that. It, it was longer here. It was brought back to three months since we brought back in other countries. Uh, and um, we, we know from evidence to date that those people who've had a primary vaccination course and um, have had an infection have a particularly strong immune response. So the rationale is that to, uh, originally what was six months and now three months is that uh, your immune response will carry you through between the primary vaccination course and, and the additional immune response you have following an infection. 
and that uh, that giving it earlier than that would have been uh, it was less beneficial. That, that, hence, the three month wait when when your when your response begins to wane, your immune response begins to wane, whether it's from the primary infection or whether whether it's from the primary vaccination course or whether it's from the infection. So it's it, there's no perfect timing here. It's a judgment issue, and other countries brought it back in recognition of the fact that Omicron was uh, showing a greater degree of breakthrough, both from primary vaccination and from immunity through. Big, uh, breakthrough through immunity, whether it's from primary vaccination or whether it's from natural infection. So there is no perfect time, but other countries have, have tended to bring it back in recognition of that breakthrough. So um, three months is what we have now. Uh, there's different uh, uh, different times in different uh, in other countries. You mentioned the UK is one month, others are longer. So There's no kind of like medical reason why you couldn't. I'm just I'm just curious as to if we want people to come forward to boosters, would it would it harm someone if they had COVID and then a month later got a booster? No. no so no, no, so why don't we just incur speed up the process if you want people well, to get boosted as soon as possible and shorten the time period we have the campaign running? We're we're also thinking of the duration that you get some additional protection from having a natural infection. As I said, what we see in the pandemic today is those people who've had both a vaccination and the natural infection seem to have a particularly robust immune response compared to people who've just had a primary vaccination course alone. So that, so when we're, when we're putting guidelines in, obviously we can't prescribe for every individual case, but we, a guideline is put in place as to give but how we're going to how we're going to administer a vaccine over a whole population. And this three months was pulled back in recognition of the increased rate of breakthrough from Omicron, but also allowing for the fact that people who've had a primary vaccination course and who've had a natural infection after that have a particularly robust immune response. We just asked about the new, um, the new isolation guidelines um, and particularly the use of high quality masks. There was some suggestion that these would be provided free and the HSE was saying they weren't. What is going to be the situation about the availability of these high quality masks? I just take some of it and Damien might want to take just in terms of what is going live tomorrow, we've been working with the system to be able for people to register their antigen test, uh, their positive antigen test, and to be able to register their close contacts. Uh, and that's what we've been working on throughout um, the last few weeks actually, to go live from tomorrow. Um, that didn't include and doesn't include an issue of a mask at station of the antigen test. Uh, and that's, that's government policy that were implemented as part of that. So uh, that's what goes live tomorrow. That's what the system does. It, it's, it's not in terms of issue of mask. Availability of masks, certainly worldwide demand, particularly on the high grade mask. I think the advice in column can, can clarify it. Um, a, a medical grade mask is, is suffice in terms of it's not just the FFP2 mask. Column, do you want to? Yeah. So uh, we, we recognise the fact that a, a properly applied medical grade mask, which is a blue mask people see, uh, offers protection. There are some people prefer, or may, we know the FFP2 mask, which is this other type of mask, is, is prescribed and advised for particular those who are symptomatic or uh, those who are contacts. Um, but uh, the medical grade mask, when properly applied, indeed, that properly applied applies to any mask, that it must be properly applied in order to afford protection. Looking forward, when you're talking about people who are fully vaccinated and being allowed to move around wearing a mask, will a medical mask suffice in those cases instead of isolating? No, I think it's too early to say that. Too early to say that. And just the only other thing I was going to add is our website tomorrow will have information. We're conscious of more than antigen tests and various other things. There can be confusion around that, so there will be you know some photographs and information from our infection prevention disease consultants that will give people some sense of advice about what that what constitutes that medical mass as well, just to assist people in that decision making. I think all of the information will be on is on our site just in terms of uh, in what context, what mask is the right appropriate uh, medical grade mask and in certain circumstances FFP FFP2 mask. So it's all on our site. Give my ignorance, when are these new um, isolation guidelines coming into force? It's all coming, kicking in as and from tomorrow. Right. As the system goes live and people kind of log their PCR test, all of the changes kick in as and from then. Jamie, correct? Yeah, correct. Is it the case that you don't need, you just need the medical mask, even if you're, if you're a close contact and you're not isolating, if you're fully vaccinated? 
There's advice for people for the whole uh, to go through the um, people who are symptomatic, um, uh, the self isolate, uh, antigen tests from the age of four to thirty nine, unless of course the three health uh, their healthcare workers, and then the remain uh, uh, um, the remain self isolating until for seven days, and the, and then uh, the last forty eight hours must be symptom free. But for for the whole for that duration and for for full ten days after the onset, they're advised the number of critical advice measures we're giving out. Uh, and one is to limit their close, close contacts outside households, especially crowded, uh, enclosed or poorly ventilated spaces. Secondly, to apply an appropriate face mask in crowd, again, crowded, enclosed or poorly ventilated spaces and when in close contact with others. Uh, thirdly, antigen tests before they might be, um, uh, these are of course applying to, uh, applying to contacts and um, uh, 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 ventilated space and prior close contact with people from outside help and also to work from home. So there's a number of, of strong public health measures we're advising along with the changes tomorrow that are important for people to, to, to uh, it's not just a question of changing the duration uh, and if for isolation or, or restricted movements for people who are close contacts, it's a question of adhering to public health measures for the full uh, span of time. But there's a number of scenarios. It's, it's really good to look at the site. There's a number of scenarios for close contacts, uh, household, and ages. So, and it does give different guidance around different mask use. Uh, Cayman Burke, the journal. Um, could I just have a quick follow up on the mask situation? Um, the chief medical officer suggested yesterday that masks would be distributed free to people once they tested positive. Um, is that ever going to be the case? I will just, as I said to John there, from our perspective, what is the case and what we've been working on is to go live tomorrow. What Damien brought through is for registration of positive uh, antigen cases and the registration of their close contacts live on the portal uh, and the follow-up process around contact tracing. Uh, that doesn't include issuing of masks uh, in terms of what our current, um, current policy is in terms of issuing it. That's currently what's going live tomorrow. And um, just the pressure on the hospital system has been mentioned a number of times. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any uh, plans to introduce mandatory vaccination for hospital staff? And uh, for Paul Reid, um, what would you say to hospital staff who still have yet to get a vaccine? Yeah, and the first part of the question for us, there are obviously policy matters for government and um, have been open this week. Uh, I don't believe that mandatory uh, process for vaccination is the, is the way to go. I think we've been served really well by the take up and the uptake, not just in vaccination, but the public support for public health guidelines throughout COVID. So I think they've worked well for us. And, and I've said openly, we've, you know, we continue to communicate with people and win hearts and minds, I think is the best approach. Uh, that's a personal view. Uh, obviously there are matters for government, uh, specifically related to staff, I said openly from the start of this whole uh, COVID that we would expect all, and I would expect all healthcare staff uh, to take up the COVID vaccine. Thankfully, that's been the experience. The vast majority of staff, there are certain exceptional cases for medical reasons, uh, which can happen, not just for healthcare staff, but for others. Uh, and that has been the experience. Uh, there's been some occasions where healthcare settings would do a risk assessment if a person hasn't been vaccinated uh, and would be moved to other roles that would be not uh, patient from, from patient care. Uh, could we just get an update on the stress on the ambulance service in, in Dublin um, and what has been done essentially to try and manage that and to overcome the issue? The ambulance service has been under pressure everywhere, um, not just in Dublin, uh, and in fact has been under more pressure in some other areas. Uh, we've been working with the voluntary providers, so you'd have seen in the last couple of weeks we've been working with uh, some of the voluntary ambulance providers who actually have been working very well with us, uh, and we have, I suppose, relationships with them anyway and they have stepped in now today we're looking at you know whether we can ease back on you know some of the the escalations that we put in place the position has improved a very small bit uh, so their staffing has improved slightly so they're still under pressure but you can see from the slide that actually their activity has normalized so they had an extremely high level of activity uh, for a few weeks um, but that has come down a bit so the, the combination of that and the prospect of staff being able to come back as those contacts who are asymptomatic will actually make a difference, but very much dependency with other providers uh, who have stepped in and we have reached arrangements with them. Just to say, the, both uh, Dublin Fire Service and the National Ambulance Service have issued a statement today urging the public to, you know, utilise the service where required uh, and, you know, where not required, not using it. And to understand they will have to, and they are having to triage, uh, you know, urgent cases, obviously, uh, based on need, but 
they've set out a very clear statement today to urge the public to support them. So the, the other point of ambulance services is that where hospitals are under pressure, they get impacted too because the handover of patients at emergency departments can slow down. Uh, so if we can't move patients through our emergency departments, it all, it all backs up. So the whole unscheduled care pathway is impacted. So um, regarding um, the antigen test portal, the, the fact it's a professional test probably rules out a lot of people who would do it for, you know, to avoid getting a vaccine. Um, but does it actually rule out people who had COVID over Christmas and couldn't get a PCR test? Does that mean they won't be able to register their positive case and therefore if they stick to the HSE's three month um, rule, they might not be able to get a do you know, uh, to travel to Europe in a couple of months? Yeah, so, so the portal will commence from tomorrow. So it's, it's about active cases from tomorrow, prospectively, not retrospectively, because it's for public health purposes in terms of contact tracing and, and, and so on. So yes, if, if there are people who were there previously um, who had a, a you know, positive antigen test and hence uh, isolate and follow the appropriate advice, there will be a lag for them. Now, bear in mind in terms of travel certs, the current primary vaccination certs, are valid for up to nine months. So they'll extend beyond the date of introduction of the booster certs on the 1st of February. So they'll still be valid for travel purposes within the EU. So it's really going to come down to timing. There may be a small number of people potentially impacted because if you go back to the primary programme, the vast majority of the younger ages became eligible later in the process towards the end of the summer. And hence their cert at the moment is valid for a period of nine months in terms of going into the new year. But there may well be still a small number of people that will be affected by that. But our analysis would suggest that it, you know, it wouldn't be a huge number, but there will be a number that are there. And also bear in mind, there are other mechanisms for travel purposes that countries accept within the EU, test prior to departure and, and so on. Paul Cullen from the Irish Times. Um, 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 um. Paul, I think you touched on it here, but maybe you might elaborate. Um, given that we're not going to be relying uh, so significantly on PCR tests for much of the population, what is the future for that vast infrastructure that we've built up? And also the surveillance of our cases, and it's going to be very difficult, isn't it, to, to sort of, uh, first of all, establish when our peak occurs and then and, and get a feel for when, what, what, what case numbers are at any particular time. Have you any thoughts? Is that, is that all going to be deconstructed or, or are the staff going to be moved on to other, other tasks? Yeah, similar to what we're doing on the vaccination, I suppose, operational strategy, we have been assessing uh, throughout in terms of the um, testing and tracing process, Paul. And I think there's, uh, first of all, PCR will be the primary, uh, and it is the primary testing process. And we expect that to continue as such. Uh, so we will always aim to have a sig very significant lab capacity, which we built up over the past few years, and that will be part of the strategy. Uh, after that, you, we would have to always be considering uh, what's the infrastructure, uh, similar to vaccination processes, that we would need to sustain. Uh, and then how do you have a scalable workforce uh, as you hit levels of pandemics? Uh, a fixed workforce would involve our public health teams. Uh, we'd see that as a fixed resource uh, and potentially a scalable workforce that you can scale up and down uh, for the future. But we don't envisage that we're anywhere near that. I mean, I recall, I think it was about last September or so, uh, when there may be in some commentary that we will uh, wind up the testing and tracing process, um, you know, we didn't, uh, and we were very clear that we had to keep that infrastructure in place. So I see us continuing with an infrastructure, continuing to have a capacity in PCR lab uh, capacity, uh, and looking at a workforce, uh, scalable workforce for the future. I don't think we're anywhere near that yet, that consideration. And I see us retaining our workforce for a, a longer, longer period of time. Just in the immediate days and weeks, how are you going to tell how many cases we have each day? It can't, would it be a combination of our PCR testing and what we can now count, which is the uh, positive antigen testing as well. We just, it'll be obviously for um, CMO and effort to um, validate that, that those counts are going through, uh, are being counted as the total cases. But we'd expect so. Damien, do you want to? Uh, yeah. yeah, just two other points. But it's important to remember as well that, like on the acute side, there's very substantial PCR testing undertaken. And also for symptomatic people at the moment, well, the, the, um, they're, the majority of those, it's under 40s on a risk basis at the moment go to antigen. All of the others go to, to PCR still. That hasn't changed even with the new guidance. So it's more around 
the close contact management now where we have that surge and also into relation to areas like early years, children, some of the screening programmes. So you're right that we're, we'll see a big increase in the number of antigen tests reported and the lack of confirm the change in the confirmatory PCR rule will mean we'll be able to bring that information together in terms of positive antigens and positive PCRs to see the cumulative picture. And um, there was a discussion earlier, reference was made to the number of patients who are in hospital, COVID patients, who, for whom that's not their primary diagnosis. And I was wondering, what are the trends in the total number of patients in hospital at the moment, week by week, and compared to previous years? Because that might be a better indicator of how busy you are, given that 30% of people are in with COVID, but not because of COVID. And that, is, that proportion has changed over the last month or so. What do you mean in terms of trends over recent re years? Well, how many patients are there in hospital for anything at the moment? And how has that varied since the end of November, for example? And how does that compare to the same periods in the last two years? Yeah, so I mean, I think in terms of when the reality is when we look at our hospitals, they're pretty full. Um, and, it, you know, so, so occupancy wise, I mean, occupancy would be the measure that we'd look at in terms of beds. What we have at the minute is a situation where probably more beds are closed. Uh, by virtue of staffing. So uh, I don't have the, like some of our sites would operate at 100% occupancy on an ongoing basis. And that hasn't changed. So in terms of our available beds, uh, we have been working at a very low level. Uh, some days this week at 90 available beds, uh, but bearing in mind that maybe 400 beds are closed. Uh, so in reality, Paul, we haven't, we, you know, we work at the edge of capacity all the time. We don't have, so the numbers of people in hospital uh, in reality, our beds are full all the time. Uh, we would rarely have, I mean, we had, we created, the only time we've had significant capacity available in hospitals where we could say we had beds available was when we made a conscious effort um, early, earlier in COVID to clear out a lot of beds. But other than that, we work pretty much at full occupancy across all sites. So how is it that much different this year from any other year then? In terms of business, it's more the impact yeah, of COVID. I mean, so the fact that we have yeah. sta so staffing challenges, uh, our staffing challenge now is very different to anything we've had really ever. Um, in terms of the number of staff that are unavailable, we are redeploying staff, we are bringing staff back from leave, uh, and we are very challenged in terms of keeping things going. We are also, in terms of how it's different, we have scaled back more on our elective work. So again, as you rightly say, this time of year, so the first couple of weeks in January, we wouldn't be doing much elective work any year, regardless, because of the predictable surge and the predictable congestion that we'd have in sites. Uh, so I think when you look at the first couple of weeks in January, you know, are we seeing anything different? Not really. We have a lot of sick people in our hospitals. We can't do much elective work. I think if you look at a longer term trend, if you look at what was happening in November, uh, if you look what will probably be happening in a couple of weeks, we still won't be back to the level of elective work that we were doing. So it's kind of, in, in a way, it's, it's very busy in a different way, but the level of busyness, if you like, is, is relatively common because we just don't have any excess capacity anytime. Just the other extra bit, Paul, as we've always said, um, the volume of COVID patients have a highly disproportionate impact because we are dealing with an isolation. We are dealing with having to close wards at certain times. We are dealing with having to move, move people into isolation uh, and the various tracing that has to go on it. So, it really has a highly disproportionate, not any fault of the patients themselves, but it has a highly disproportionate impact on us. A thousand COVID patients is very different than a thousand patients in for a range of different illnesses. I was just wondering, Damien, uh, do you have a figure for the number of people who've gone to the trouble of applying for a certificate of recovery? Uh, I don't, but I can get a few, Paul, in terms of, I know on the digital search there's over 1.4 million issued already and the balance then are get, getting text or have got a text in order to get their email address and they'll go by post then if they need to as well. That's on the new certificates, but I don't have on the recovery certs. I can get that for you though. It's the, the system there is run through uh, the Department of Health rather than in the HSE, but I can get that number. Maybe Paul, I just add, one of the things that's different when you say what's different, you know, our capacity to discharge now with staffing issues in home support and even prior to this current staffing issue in home support, the challenge of getting carers. So we have, if you go back a number of years ago, you'll know it was funding was the issue, couldn't fund people to leave. Now we can't get the carers and we have the funding. Um, so the detox, and again, you know, the, the detox number would be lower than it would have been three years ago. Um, but that now is, is different. Cad and Scaly is Janie Freenham. Fwyna Maeskina. Fwyna Maeskina. Uh, well, it's a uh, real good thing to do with 
agus bis ég tosnig man hér nort agus banish is inni ismo me varach le le bis de kastna agus an multi thamajig skapa machig dini majra eatsn will tash is jafaka acha na eatsn a vi jagvail a gini ella agus multa dife black olish an on mask FFP2 mar hoktar amerla agus Majulish and probably Gitchina of Nolte Takini now, Cleelish and Mask Lias Marhotter, Augustin Bishig Scapu and Multishin Tostu and Noct Lishnery Rica Ella, a man he Tostu Mani here non. Cade on effect, um, Conserva Schlancher, Free Lawher, um, Con Amicom. Well, it's later doing this. You go to the castle in Argentina, Rio. I guess she didn't scale anyone near her for doing for that. I guess after a nasc, either near the castle. I guess um, on Docker a hen loaf at the shooting of the lager. I guess now this. I guess the hierarchy. I guess the figure. I guess the I guess the hot of the curum. The 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 energy. The curum. The shooting. I to shine a dollar lager can hour us. So it's my not a shin, ox in Racha is Kus Imni Dunya, Gulla Casta Kohar de Satashi, Tishk got a big winch, giving skier might than the Casta Shinny Gahus, now Shakin Taroina, I was beaching Chakta Shakfi Kurum, Nospi Lug, August and Nanage Dian Kurum of us. Just ask Paul, um, were you or the HSE asked at any time to provide free masks uh, to the to the pub to any group of the public? Our whole focus has been our, our, the whole ask for us and the requirement for us was building the system around the antigen test, and that's been the it's been the sole focus over the past couple of weeks. Were you asked by anybody to provide them? It hasn't been. Free. It's it's not policy, and the minister clarified it so. It wasn't a requirement of us to do it. Can you answer the question, yes or no? That's exactly it, Paul. There was no requirement, no specific ask for us to, to develop uh, an issue on a free mask with an ancient test, so it's not policy. Right. It's not policy, so we will, if we get our policy direction and we implement on it. Did you discuss it with the minister, someone from the Department of Health? Discuss which, sorry, the issue on the free masks. Yeah, I certainly haven't. Any of your teams, you know, not really. So, misunderstanding. Yeah, look, simply, I don't think this is anything genuine. I don't think this is anything very significant. Everybody's focus, particularly from a public health perspective, was to get the antigen, issuing of antigen up and running and recorded. So, I don't think this is anything that is a huge disagreement. Okay, uh, thank you all very much.